Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Rita Ulrich, and I'll be your, your host tonight. I've been a member of Wild Ones for seven years, and I serve on the board of directors. We're excited to welcome you to tonight's online program, Native Plants for Improving Outdoor Air Quality, with Eric Fusley. This web is being hosted on YouTube Live, and you're welcome to use the chat feature during the presentation. If you want to hide the chat box, please go into full screen mode. Links referenced in tonight's presentation can be found in the description below. We did have a number of questions that were submitted during registration and we'll be discussing those after Eric's presentation. Closed captioning is available and can be turned on in your settings. And this program is being recorded and it will be posted on our website and social media channels. We'll also be sending you a link to the recording sometime afterwards. If you do experience a technical issue tonight, please email support at wildones.org. We have people standing by for you. For those of you new to Wild Ones, we're a membership organization devoted to promoting native plants and sustainable landscaping. At the national level, we do this by producing educational materials and programs such as the Wild Ones Journal, Native Garden Designs, a Seed for Educations program, and webinars like this one. At the local level, Wild Ones chapters offer programs, including speakers, conferences, garden tools, native plant sales, and seed exchanges. We now have 70 chapters and 22 seedlings in 27 states. If you look on that map, you will see that the dark green markers are chapters and the light green markers are seedlings. If you're not a Wild Ones member, we hope you join us and take advantage of the support and learning opportunities you'll find by joining the chapter. Chapters are where members get their hands dirty and learn by doing. Many of our young seedlings are actively recruiting chapter officers and planning this year's programs. And all of our chapters offer a wealth of volunteer opportunities. Doesn't matter your skill level. If you're interested, they'll likely welcome your, your help. Chapters require the time and talents of many different people to do their work. So you can amplify the impact that you have as part of the native plant movement by sharing your skills and passion. Please reach out to your local chapter to find out how to get involved. If there isn't a chapter near you, please think about starting a seedling. Get in touch with us and we'll help you with that process and, and put you in touch with other people in your area who might also be interested. Programs like tonight's webinar would not be possible without generous support from many people. Please consider donating to Wild Ones. We inspire and empower people and communities across the country to transform landscapes into vibrant and essential habitats for birds, bees, bats, bears, butterflies, and all wildlife, including us. Together, we can continue to raise awareness of the importance of native plants and do our part to make a positive impact on the environment. Tonight's presentation with speaker Eric Fusile on native plants for improving outdoor air quality is the second in our three-part green infrastructure series. This was developed as a follow-up to a presentation Eric did in January on, on the topic. Tonight he will go more in depth on phytoremediation and using it to improve, in, sorry, improve indoor, sorry, outdoor air quality. And he'll cover a wider range of native plant species and contaminants. Eric is an environmental scientist at Olson, an engineering and design firm, and he's based out of their Fayette, Arkansas, Fayetteville, Arkansas office. He conducts environmental impact studies and works with civil engineers and design lab, designers, landscape architects to minimize the impact from infrastructure projects that they design. He's a member of the Wild Ones National Board of Directors, and he chartered the Wild One Ozark chapter in 2020, and he continues to serve as chapter president. So let's get started and learn how native plants and phytoremediation can improve outdoor air quality. Eric, could you unmute yourself and turn on your video? Yes, <clears throat> shared my screen. Okay, well, we, we, are, we appreciate you being here with us tonight. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you I, yeah I appreciate that, Rita. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, again, talking about 
uh, two topics that are near and dear to my heart, uh, native plants and um, phytoremediation. Let me kind of get my screen set up here. All right, are we good? Uh, you see in my, my first slide there? All right, so um, yeah, thank you again for joining me as we continue to broaden our focus. Uh, I like to start off with this concept uh, just because I like to, uh, you know, really challenge people to start thinking uh, beyond or in addition to how, how we, we can use native plants uh, in other ways, uh, in addition to, um, you know, providing habitat for wildlife, pollinators, that sort of thing. Um, you know, those things are, you know, very, very important, uh, but I think that there are still other things that we can consider as well when we're deciding which native species to use uh, on the landscape, you know, and we can thoughtfully place some of these species on the landscape to help us improve environmental quality. Uh, that's environmental quality that benefits uh, wildlife and humans as well. So, um, that's why I always start off with this uh, little bit of focus, broadening our focus slide in our series. And I'm going to move forward to the next, uh, the importance of air quality. You know, just, you know, the last webinar was on water quality, storm water quality, you know, and, and water, uh, you know, it's, we drink it, we rely on it. Uh, everything on this earth is dependent on it. And it's the same way with our air uh, for the most part. Um, you know, even things in the ocean consume uh, oxygen uh, and other gases. But here on the terrestrial environment, we, we really do depend on uh, having out, uh, you know, good quality outdoor air quality. I mean, exposure to airborne pollutants is a risk factor in various diseases uh, such as emphysema, asthma, uh, COPD, also known as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You know, uh, it's shown that people that live in air environments with uh, heavy amounts of air pollution tend to have higher rates of dealing with these um, adverse health, of health effects than people who live in cleaner uh, environments and breathe cleaner air, drink cleaner water. So, what can we do to uh, improve our air quality? And that's where, again, I want to really um, bring up phytoremediation. Uh, these are plant-based methods of remediating or contaminating environment, or I'm sorry, remediating or containing environmental contaminants in soil, sediment, groundwater, or surface water, or in this case, we're going to broaden that focus a little bit to the atmosphere. And we're going to start off with particulate matter. Uh, what is particulate matter? Well, particulates uh, refers to uh, the mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets found it suspended in the air. Common examples could include dust, soot, soot uh, smoke, a uh, wide range of things. And we'll go into a little more detail uh, as we get into other contaminants because it turns out a lot of the other contaminants can attach themselves to the particulates um, and um, have other impacts uh, to air quality as well. Sources of particulates include industrial activities, automobile emissions, oil and gas refineries, coal burning power plants, smokestacks, fires, construction sites, when you think about dust, uh, unpaved roads, uh, even uh, freshly tilled agricultural fields, if it's uh, dry enough and get some heavy winds, you know, think about uh, wind erosion uh, being a source of particulates in, in the air. Uh, I remember sometimes, you know, you get these over here in North America, this dusty haze. Uh, and it, um, when was that? Several years ago, we had a big dusty haze uh, in the air. And it, uh, they um, were reporting that it was from uh, sand from the Sahara Desert. And so as our environment uh, continues to warm, uh, we might start to see more of this wind erosion uh, taking place each year. So these part, uh, particles, they can range in size. Some are large enough or dark enough to be visible to the naked eye, and others are only able to be detected using an electron microscope. So uh, they can range from yeah, the visible to the microscopic. And we generally divide these into two categories. Uh, first one's PM or particulate matter 10, which is about 10 microns or smaller. Uh, these are all inhalable particles. Uh, the diameter, like I mentioned, was 10 microns or smaller, at least down to uh, two and a half microns. So that's the second category, the much finer inhalable particles, uh, which these are going to be equal to or smaller than two and a half microns. So very, very fine. There's a diagram kind of comparing some of these to uh, the size of a human hair. 
So because of their small sizes, uh, particulates can become lodged deeply into our lung tissue. This is mo more of an issue with the much finer particles, the PM 2.5 particles, uh, because they're, they can lodge themselves more deeply into our lung tissue, wildlife, uh, lung tissue of wildlife, they pose an even greater danger, not only to their to that ability, but also due to their ability to travel greater distances in the atmosphere. They're much easier to become suspended and then transport uh, through wind, uh, gusts, whatnot. Once they get lodged into our lung tissue, they can cause irritation to the respiratory airways, reduce lung function, uh, and have even been linked to cardiac diseases and some cancers. So kind of similar to, uh, you know, black lung, uh, people that uh, smoke cigarettes or cigars their whole life. I mean, it's a very similar type of effect when you live in this uh, polluted air uh, in some parts of the world, some, in some large cities. Uh, you, you start to experience adverse health impacts uh, from these particulates. They can also, like I mentioned earlier, attach to other uh, contaminants such as heavy metals, uh, including lead. Uh, and so, um, you know, when these particulates settle onto leaf surfaces, some of them can be absorbed into the plant. And that's where we want to bring in how, uh, a type of phytotechnology or phy uh, form of phytoremediation called phytoaccumulation. So this is a picture of a leaf with particulate matter uh, shown in a, a microscopic scale. So uh, blown up. So you can see the, the scale up there, the upper right hand corner of the picture, it's about uh, two microns. So these are very small. These would be the, the PM 2.5 particles. So what is phytoaccumulation? Well, this is the process where these aerosol particles are deposited on the solid surfaces of leaves where they are then accumulated. Uh, and then this decreases their concentration in the air. So basically using leaves to catch uh, these particles um, and um, they, you know, Airborne particles can carry a wide range of other contaminants, like I mentioned, from PAHs to persistent organic pollutants to heavy metals. So uh, consider, we'll be talking a little bit more in the next presentation about um, uh, PCBs or poly, um, what is it? Poly, oh, I can't remember the C, but biphenyls. Anyway, that's a very persistent pollutant that's been in our environment uh, for decades that were actually banned in the 70s, but we still find them everywhere. Uh, however, once deposited, uh, some of these particles can be absorbed into the plant, depending on what the particle is, uh, although most are retained on the leaf surface. Uh, this is only a temporary form of uh, improving the air quality. I mean, most of these particles are later either going to become resuspended into the atmosphere or deposited into the soil after either being washed off by a good rain or, you know, from uh, the leaves falling off the tree at the end of the growing season in the case of um, um, deciduous trees or, you know, even some of the evergreens when they shed some of their needles. So, you know, to, depending on what those uh, uh, contaminants are, once they uh, are deposited into the soil uh, below the trees, you know, we could consider using other or additional uh, methods of phytotechnology to remediate uh, these particles that might uh, become uh, resuspended and stormwater runoff or whatnot. So when we're looking at the different types of trees or our plants that we want to uh, utilize phytoaccumulation in improving uh, air quality or trying to capture some of these particulate matters, uh, the conifers are going to be much more effective at capturing uh, the, the PM 2.5, the, the much finer particulates than will be the, the broadleaf species. However, uh, with broadleaf trees, we can still choose uh, species that have waxy leaf coatings or fuzzy leaves, leaf hairs, or greater leaf area index. These are gonna be better uh, than species without those traits at capturing these uh, particulates. So just some examples here of some of the uh, various uh, native conifers and uh, needle species uh, across the, the United States. We'll start off here with one that uh, is very common here in, in my part of the world of the Ozarks in Arkansas, the shortleaf pine, uh, one of our most common uh, native pines here, uh, and all, as well as um, many parts of the, the southeastern United States, one of the yellow pines. Uh, Loblolly pine, another one that's common uh, south of the Ozarks and in uh, the rest of the southeastern United States. Virginia pine, 
a little bit further east than where I'm located, white pine, limber pine. This is more of a Western species. Pinion pine. Lodgepole pine. Ponderosa pine. Rocky Mountain juniper, one of our juniper species. One seed juniper, more common in the Southwest. Common juniper, one that we do not have here in Arkansas where I'm located. Utah juniper. Rocky Mountain fir. White fir. Blue spruce, beautiful tree. Engelman spruce. Douglas fir. American holly. This is one that we have here in my part of the country. It's very waxy leaves. Southern magnolia. Yellow poplar also known as tulip poplar. Beautiful tulip-like flowers. Black tupelo. Northern red oak. Post oak. Cherry bark oak. Black cherry. Nine bark, getting into some more shrubby species here. Wax current. Rusty black haw, one of my favorite viburnums. All right, so what are some potential applications for some of these species? Well, I mean, placing them along urban roadways or interstates to have high traffic volumes, uh, that's one potential use. A lot of the particulates coming from auto automobile exhaust, or at least from automobiles that are burning fossil fuels. Uh, this is a common source of, of these in the environment. In or near an industrial district, near uh, an oil of refineries, coal burning power plants, uh, that sort of stuff. And you'll see a, a theme here um, throughout a lot of the contaminants I discuss. Uh, you'll see it, a lot of it can be tied towards uh, fossil fuels. So kind of something to think about. All right, so what about nitrogen dioxide? Nitrogen oxides are created by the combustion of fossil fuels. Um, that's one source of these in the environment. Um, they can come from power plants or uh, automobile emissions, or at least from automobiles uh, that are not non-electric vehicles. Uh, nitrogen oxides are also major contributors to acid rain and smog. Overexposure to the nitrogen oxides can cause irritation to the respiratory airways, into the mucosa, the eyes and nose. So those already, already struggle, struggling with certain diseases uh, like COPD uh, are especially susceptible to the adverse impacts or effects from breathing uh, higher levels of nitrogen oxides in their air. Again, other sources uh, on this, uh, we're gonna speak specifically about nitrogen dioxide. And this can come from burning fossil fuels, automobile emissions and power plants. Uh, plants uh, take up uh, nitrogen dioxide from the atmosphere. They assimilate it into their organic uh, nitrogen-containing compounds. Those species vary in their uh, capability to do this. So this brings us to another way that we can make use of uh, plant processes, uh, and that is with phytometabolism. What is phytometabolism? This is a process where organic contaminants are first broken down by plants through phytodegradation. Uh, which we discussed in the last webinar, and then incorporated into the plant's biomass. So in order for plants to grow, they need nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Uh, they use these to carry out photosynthesis to build their biomass. Uh, so these nutrients are in inorganic elements. So plants first have to break down organic molecules uh, to get to these inorganic elements. So sometimes they can make use of organic contaminants to get uh, what they need, and that's going to be uh, phytodegradation and phytometabolism, the metabolites that are left over from this process are then quote unquote phytometabolized and incorporated into the plant's biomass. 
So uh, there was a study that was conducted where they looked at 70 uh, different species of, and they were looking at which species had a high assimilation of nitrogen dioxide into their plant tissue, as well as a high resistance to damage from nitrogen dioxide, since this is a, um, a, a a compound that can be uh, can damage uh, tissue of living organisms. They found four species uh, that had uh, both those qualities, high assimilation of NO2, high resistance to tissue damage from NO2. Of those four species, one of them, the black locust, uh, is native to North America. So uh, there's something I want to point out about the black locust is uh, would be great if we wanted to consider planting this in industrial areas, near roadways, airports, or any other areas where uh, these nitrogen dioxide emissions are high. All right, so about sulfur oxides. Sulfur oxides are released into the atmosphere from the combustion of fossil fuels. Uh, there's that word again, where they contribute to acid rain and smog, similar to nitrogen dioxide. Adverse health effects from exposure to sulfur oxides are similar to those of nitrogen oxides, causing inflammation of the respiratory airways and impaired lung functioning. Uh, also, uh, SO2, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide can create complex chemical reactions that result in most of the forms of particulate matter in the atmosphere. So there we are bringing it back to particulate matter. And then ammonia. These uh, gaseous ammonia combines with sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides to form ammonia salts. So these are harmful forms of fine particulate matter. So ammonia being uh, one nitrogen atom, three hydrogen atoms, um, combines with uh, these other sulfur oxides, nitrogen dioxides uh, to create an excess of particulate matter. All right, so what is one common source of um, ammonia in air. Uh, well, poultry tunnel fan emissions. Uh, here uh, in my part of the country, uh, poultry farming is really big. We're in the Ozarks. The ground is rocky and steep, not great for agriculture, at least growing row crops. So what do the people around here do? Well, traditionally, they grew, they raised chickens. Uh, this is why uh, Tyson Chicken, uh, one of the largest uh, meat uh, distributors, uh, is located, headquartered here in my part of the state, northwest Arkansas, Springdale. Uh, well, in the chicken farms, there's a lot of uh, ammonia, uh, gaseous ammonia, that uh, they have these tunnel fans that blow this ammonia out of the chicken houses. Well, that can create some issues. So what can we do about this? Well, we can consider using native species for windbreaks. And the Natural Resources Conservation Service has done research uh, looking at uh, which species um, are gonna, would be good to use as windbreaks and, and how uh, we can uh, plant these species to uh, reduce ammonia uh, emissions that are, are at least uh, reducing the distribution or spread of these ammonia emissions as they are uh, leaving these poultry houses. And they found that windbreaks uh, grow, uh, consisting of warm season grasses planted in rows that are parallel with that row of tunnel fans. So uh, the, the way you plant them is gonna be important. So you have a chicken house, a wall, and then you have a, a, a line of tunnel fans along that wall, make sure that that row is parallel. But not just that, but you need to have at least a minimum of two rows, uh, preferably more. But they found that uh, at least a minimum of two should be used uh, and planted about two feet apart. Uh, each row should also extend an additional 20 feet past the tunnel fins on either side or each side. So that way um, you're able to capture all of those ammonia emissions. Uh, they found the best results uh, are gained whenever the rows are planted as close to the fans as possible without disrupting the fans' performance. Uh, they, uh, in that study, they, uh, they found that to be about 20 feet away from the fans to be effective. Uh, and also they found if you include more than one species, uh, this is going to be better so that uh, insect pests or pathogens won't devastate the planting. Uh, and if you include more than one species, also uh, put the tallest species uh, furthest away, or at least in the back, uh, and then the shorter species up front. And this is going to help capture more of those ammonia emissions. So the species that they looked at uh, in the study that they found were effective were uh, switchgrass, which grows uh, across uh, a, a large swath of North America, Indian grass, and coastal panic grass. So windbreaks consisting of these uh, could be effective means of 
<clears throat> capturing that ammonia and preventing it from <clears throat> spreading through the atmosphere. All right, so what about volatile organic compounds? What are these? Well, these are compounds that have a high vapor pressure and a low water solubility. So they're more likely to become volatile in the air. Uh, so maybe you have a, a liquid can of uh, something that's considered VOC, but as you pour it out, it's gonna evaporate and uh, turn into a vapor pretty easily. Uh, VOCs are emitted from a variety of sources, including paints, adhesives, cleaning products, as well as uh, fuels from automil, automobile emissions or I'm sorry, fuels and automobile emissions. It's interesting to note that about two thirds of the VOC emissions in the atmosphere are actually generated by the world's vegetation. Uh, this would be a case where they are taking in um, things from the roots and transpiring uh, VOCs through the leaves. Uh, so depending on what's in those roots um, or in the soil around it uh, might be, um, it would be coming out through the leaves as they respire. And so uh, just an interesting thing to note there. However, exposure to VOCs have also been linked to an increased risk of cancer. Uh, this is going to be more, uh, you know, having to do with indoor air quality, uh, but at low levels, they can irritate the tissue in the eyes, nose, and respiratory airways. And VOCs also have a powerful neurological, can have powerful neurological effects, cause headaches, dizziness, and even memory impairment. Of course, uh, more of an issue in small and enclosed environments. Once in the atmosphere, VOCs can then combine with other elements in the air to form ozone. And that's where uh, we you know, need to be more cognizant of um, the um, VOCs, especially when we're choosing uh, urban street trees and plants and whatnot. So ground level ozone, another common contaminant that uh, people in uh, larger met metropolitan areas have to deal with. Uh, this is created by reactions between uh, the VOCs and nitrogen oxides. Again, that's an element that uh, we discussed earlier as they're exposed to sunlight. The sunlight is kind of a catalyst for a chemical reaction uh, that uh, causes these to react and uh, you end up with three oxygen atoms binding together to form ozone. Uh, inhaling ozone can create a variety of health problems, mostly affecting the respiratory system. It can uh, exacerbate asthma and bronchitis, as well as impair lung function. Common symptoms of ozone overexposure include a sore throat, coughing, shortness of breath, and pain or burning in the chest. So, studies so have revealed that planting urban street trees, especially trees that emit lower levels of these VOCs, can be a viable strategy to help reduce urban ozone levels. So what are some uh, potential trees we can look at that have been shown to emit uh, lower amounts of VOCs? Well, Eastern Red Cedar, uh, Juniperus virginiana, the most common cedar uh, found here in the, the, the part of the country that I live in, Downey Serviceberry, Basswood, also heard it called Basswood, Winged Elm, a little bit smaller, kind of an understory tree. American elm, a little larger there. Slippery elm, one of my favorites. American dwarf birch, something that's more uh, common in the northwestern part of the, the, the country. Water birch. All right, so these urban trees uh, provide additional benefits such as reducing air temperature and thus transpiration rates uh, due to the shade that they provide. This helps reduce energy usage uh, and how consequently re uh, reduces power, power plant emissions. So there's this uh, little chain reaction. Uh, and so this reduction in emissions from power plants can also help further reduce urban ozone levels. Uh, so just another uh, thing to think about with these urban street trees are not if we choose, I mean, if we choose species that are emitting less VOCs, um, they're also providing enough shade, uh, reducing, um, you know, how much power we're using, especially with uh, fossil fuels, then we're helping in more the way than one reduce urban ozone levels. A uh, study that was conducted uh, in 2006 concluded that in the United States, the positive physical effects provided by urban street trees are more beneficial than the chemical release of VOCs in terms 
of affecting levels of ozone concentration. So while we could select, um, you know, the species that have emit lower VOCs, uh, just keep in mind that the, the shade um, is, is going to be ultimately the most important thing, um, just because of the benefits, um, the amount uh, that the VOCs that they're releasing is going to be um, less than what we get uh, for, of a reduction through a reduction in our fossil fuels by reducing energy consumption uh, by the shade that they provide. So uh, the arrangement in which the vegetation is planted is also important. Air pollutants are dispersed primarily by wind, uh, so the effects of emissions are not necessarily confined to the immediate vicinity of their source. Uh, they found that uh, particulates originating from roadways often travel up 240 feet from their source. So, uh, you know, what does that tell you? Well, vegetation buffers can be planted adjacent to locations where land use of, uh, produce emissions high in particulates, nitrogen dioxides, whether that be roadways with high traffic volumes, industrial districts, oil refineries, coal burning power plants. Uh, but, you know, it means that, you know, we should consider um, having a, a, you know, a wide enough buffer. Now, that might mean... Um, having other things interspersed uh, between those trees. You don't have to necessarily devote it entirely uh, to a buffer, uh, but you can have that buffer up above buildings, whatnot, um, or, you know, one-story buildings at least. Uh, these buffers can be effective for distances up to 600 feet from the sources of these contaminants. Uh, another thing to consider is that whenever we plant urban street trees too closely together, uh, this can form what's called a green ceiling over the street environment. And so in uh, dense urban areas, uh, urbanized areas where you have these tall buildings, um, you know, that create what are called street canyons, these green ceilings can actually also trap pollutants at street level, uh, which actually reduces the low level air quality. So what does that mean? Well, in these ur dense urban areas with tall buildings and street canyons, then we should give consideration to the spacing of trees to allow sufficient ventilation so that some of these contaminants, such as ground level ozone, aren't adversely impacting the air quality uh, where a lot of the human activity is occurring. Uh, not so much of an issue uh, in other parts of the country, but something to consider if you're um, in one of these uh, densely urbanized areas. However, the most beneficial contribution that urban street trees make to air quality is their contribu contribution to passive temperature cooling and the sequestration of atmospheric carbon. Uh, it's estimated that urban street trees in the United States uh, sequester approximately 700 million tons of carbon from the atmosphere. And that brings us to carbon dioxide which is, as many of us know, um, I think at this point almost everyone knows, is a greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide, uh, strong greenhouse gas, contributes to the rise of global temperatures and resulting changes in climate. As well as acid rain. Um, you know, when you have higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as these rain droplets are falling through the sky, uh, these carbon dioxide uh, molecules become trapped in the rainwater. They react with the H2O to create carbonic acid. And with enough carbon dioxide, you can actually reduce the pH level of the rain uh, to make it low enough to where it impacts plant life. So what can we do uh, to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere using plants? Uh, well, for one thing, fast growing trees. Um, these are gonna store the most carbon during the first decades. Also long lived trees, uh, these are going to be able to store carbon longer uh, before they die and decompose and then release that carbon back into the atmosphere. And also trees that have large leaves and wide crowns, this is going to maximize uh, the amount of photosynthesis that they're able uh, to conduct. You know, photosynthesis is that uh, method where trees are pulling in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and turning it into uh, glucose. So some trees that fit these criteria include bald cypress, has an average lifespan of 600 years, uh, can even live as long as 1,800 years. So when I was doing some research for this presentation, this one was at the top of the list. White ash, again, uh, another long-lived species uh, that meet the criteria mentioned earlier. Black tupelo. Yellow poplar. 
you might notice that some of these species are, are were used uh, when we're discussing particulate matter, white pine, shortleaf pine, white oak, chestnut oak, northern red oak, live oak. One of my favorites doesn't grow uh, in my part of the country, but anytime I visit Louisiana, uh, I always love to see the, the live oaks. All right, now, deep-rooted perennials uh, is another way that we can help sequester carbon, uh, especially with these native perennial uh, prairie grasses. These typically have very deep roots uh, when these species are um, sequestering carbon through, through photosynthesis. That carbon is then translocated below ground as the roots continue to grow. Now, when the roots die, that carbon is then sequestered deep into the soil as they decompose instead of being released back into the atmosphere if, as if they were to, um, um, if they died above ground or the above ground components of the plant decomposed. Uh, and, and until that soil is tilled, uh, then it can be pretty much um, sequestered there for a very, very long time. Uh, so when we consider uh, what kind of environments uh, we have these, uh, well, prairies. So focusing on prairie conservation uh, is one way that we can uh, support the sequestration of carbon through a natural you know, ecosystem. Another uh, natural ecosystem that sequesters a large amount of carbon are wetlands. Uh, you know, these are, are you know, largely due to the fact that these wetlands uh, are sequestering carbon in their soil in much the same way that prairies are. Uh, the plants are uh, taking in carbon through photosynthesis, uh, but where um, due to the anoxic conditions or the low uh, oxygen uh, levels in the wetland soils due to the fact that they're saturated with water, uh, the organisms that break things down in those conditions usually Break, do so at a very much slower rate uh, than uh, microorganisms uh, do in uh, oxic environments or uh, air places with plenty of oxygen. So you get a accumulation of carbon in that process. They're breaking the carbon down uh, and the uh, dead material down at a much slower rate than it is being accumulated through photosynthesis. So as plants uh, build up their biomass and then they die and they fall to the bottom of that swamp or that uh, marsh or whatnot, um, they're you know, usually adding carbon to that wetland soil. Wetland soils tend to be very dark, very black. Uh, there's a whole name for them called histosols. Uh, it's also the reason why um, a couple hundred years ago, a lot of um, the, the European uh, settlers drained a lot of our wetlands to uh, you know, turn into cropland. Uh, it's also why certain parts of Florida, that ground is slowly subsiding, uh, shrinking, because uh, as these uh, wet, old wetland soils are being exposed to atmosphere, that um, they're starting to decompose much quicker. So uh, just one thing to consider uh, is that wetland areas, um, it will continue to build up and can store large, large amounts of carbon. Uh, there's different kinds of wetlands. Uh, there are swamps, which are forested wetlands, and there are marshes, uh, there are wet prairies. Uh, so you can get combinations. You know, a forest is definitely able to sequester a lot of carbon into the above ground biomass, these trees, as well as the roots. Uh, but, you know, trees can only grow so large. So uh, that carbon sequestration eventually reaches a point uh, where a forest can, can't really uh, continue uh, to make any significant changes in the amount of carbon it's sequestering, uh, whereas wetlands are able to continue uh, sequestering more and more carbon. Uh, in prairies, we get uh, a certain type of soil called a mollusol. These tend to be very dark also because of the uh, carbon that's being sequestered uh, through the roots of these deep prairie plants. So think about if we were to combine a wet prairie, uh, a wet swamp, that sort of thing. Um, these should be high, high value areas for uh, the consideration of conservation efforts. Uh, so here's a chart uh, that I, I, I like. It was uh, put together by the World Climate Council. Uh, showing the amount of uh, below ground carbon sequestration versus above ground. And as you can see, wetlands, temperate grasslands, uh, boreal forest uh, lead, lead the charge and uh, how many uh, 
let's see how what units are they looking at here carbon stored carbon in tons per hectare so at ground depth of one meter so three feet deep so as you can see, improving air quality is yet another application of phytoremediation in which native plants can help improve environmental quality. Uh, the greatest improvement in air quality is going to be uh, from urban street trees and other vegetation. Uh, has, you know, the greatest improvements has been reported uh, for particulate matter, ozone, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide, with a greater percentage of tree coverage found to be correlated with an improvement in air quality. However, size does matter. Uh, there was a study conducted in 2008 uh, by Yang et al. Uh, that determined that the larger plants and those with a greater leaf surface area are better overall at reducing the contaminants uh, that we've discussed here in this presentation. Uh, so this is what their um, data showed. Uh, this is uh, the amount of each of these contaminants uh, that could be um, improved uh, gram per square meter per year. And as you can see, deciduous trees uh, uh, we're able to make the most improvements, uh, followed by tall herbaceous plants, uh, and then uh, short grasses. So the larger, the better. But uh, really, you know, since we see a lot of these contaminants have their origin in fossil fuels, uh, <clears throat> you know, I don't think that we can uh, really knock out the problem without our switch to renewable energy. So a simultaneous reduction in our use of fossil fuels, native plants can play an important role in the regenerative efforts to improve and restore air quality. And with that, uh, we'll conclude my presentation and let Rita take back the screen. Well, Eric, thanks so much. That's fascinating stuff and I could I could listen to this again a few more times just to follow along I um, in particular um, am interested in learning a little bit more about the wetlands and how they function because that's I did not know that had no idea so that's great I did know about the boreal forest and the temperate um, grasslands but and and by the way uh, thank you for the Cheech and Chong slide that was brilliant <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I had to just tell myself there were some chuckles out there, uh, especially when you're speaking to a you know blank screen. <laughs> I hope exactly. people found that funny. I, I'm sure there were, <laughs> um, particularly with the, the little memory loss comment. <laughs> so before we start the, the q and I just want to note um, the link to our post-event survey. So let's see. Let, Let's see if we can get to that slide. Uh, if you aren't, um, there we go. If you aren't seeing uh, that or don't have a chance to do that tonight, please uh, do it when we send out a link to the survey and um, your feedback will help us uh, improve these webinars. One other note before we get to the Q and A is, uh, Next Thursday, the 21st, we will conclude this series with Eric's presentation on improving soil contamination. So using native plants to take up soil contaminants, which I think is gonna be interesting because I'm gonna ask him about what happens to insects that eat those plants. So uh, join us next week if you're, if you're interested in these topics. And um, I'm sure that's going to be another really fascinating seminar. So uh, let's go ahead and, and get to some of the questions you had. Um, these are questions, folks, that were submitted during registration. So let's, I'm starting with um, what native plants are suitable for near a heavily used roadway? In this case, a specific reference to the FDR Drive in New York City. Yeah, and I think that's where, um, you know, look at what's going to be emitted there. And, you know, we have obviously a lot of particulates coming from um, those automobile emissions, you know, and then, like I mentioned, they uh, can be combined with others uh, to form ozone, and, you know, and a lot of the particulates can be a result of, you know, nitrogen dioxide um, or nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxides. So, you know, when we're looking at particulates, like I said, a lot of those, those conifers are going to be best. Um, 
you know, I'm not as familiar with New York City. So, um, you know, ideally you'd be able to have a good buffer of these trees, um, you know, extending, you know, 240 feet, 600 feet. But I understand that's not always um, feasible in certain parts of the world. Arkansas is a little bit different. Uh, we don't have that here necessarily in, in, in the urban areas, but um, you know, I would like to see more, you know, just trees, more urban trees we have, these trees can act as these buffers uh, and just kind of reduce the spread uh, of these contaminants and emissions coming from automobile exhaust. You know, there was a study done in New York City uh, a, a while back, back when, you know, there used to be leaded gasoline, just looking at the exposure of traffic cops uh, to lead. Um, you know, they're out there directing traffic and their um, lead can be volatilized in automobile exhaust. And so uh, they found that they were being exposed to heavy amounts of lead um, back in those days. So luckily, uh, leaded gasoline is no longer being used. But um, that was that was an issue that, you know, probably very few of them may have, may have known about. Uh, I agree. I wouldn't have thought about that. No, unless I'm Especially. reading it, I might start thinking then. But right, you might start looking into it. it. <laughs> but think about it. people walking on the streets. You know, back in those days. You know, especially like in areas like they're densely urbanized, those street canyons I spoke of, where it's more difficult for these um, contaminants to be able to to leave uh, the canyon. So, I mean, there could have yeah. been a higher exposures to lead uh, in the air that people were breathing. And, and, a, and a similar question, but different environment. Um, are there natives, trees and shrubs, efficient at improving air quality for houses that are close to roads? Yeah, and again, that's where I would just uh, try to select, uh, you know, try to create some sort of windbreak using either, you know, conifers, whatever conifers are native to your area, uh, or species that have, you know, waxy leaves, hairy leaves, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, you know, it's that's going to be your your best bet, trying to reduce airflow from these um, contaminant sources. Yeah, we did that um, at a, at the the place I grew up, and it didn't reduce noise, but it's in, and but it was a nice okay. visual screen, of course. And uh, I didn't know it was probably also reducing localized pollution. Because it was a heavily trafficked road, so yeah. Yep. Part of what I do are these traffic noise studies, and yeah, summer. One thing you learn in the training is that uh, plants don't do very much at all to reduce noise. You know, you think about you can be hiking in the woods, you know, hundreds of feet away from a road, but you can still hear cars going up and down it. You know, it just the sound bounces between the vegetation, the trunks, and whatnot. So it's usually you have to get something pretty thick um, buffer of to to see any sort of re reduction in decibel levels. Yeah, so that's why generally they use noise barriers uh, that are built out of a certain material to help reduce noise levels. Yeah. Um, so there were, this is a two question uh, from one person. Um, he's asking, he or she is asking, what are some of the best plants for outdoor air quality? Now you've covered a lot of that overall, um, but maybe in, in a general sense, what would be? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you see a lot of this keep getting tied back to particulate matter, uh, all the different contaminants and how they relate to our particulate matter. And I think that's just, you know, looking at uh, those species uh, for urban areas, uh, but then also paying attention to, you know, if you're in an area uh, that's densely urbanized with street canyons, making sure you're allowing some ven ventilation. I mean, there's going to be definitely benefits uh, with the shade. So, um, you know, if you're in an area that can allow, you uh, you know, to have a, a green ceiling, so to speak, uh, then that's going to be better as well because you're going to help reduce emissions uh, elsewhere at the power plant or, you know, uh, you know, as long as we're relying on fossil fuels anyway. Now, this talk would probably be completely different if we were on, you know, completely 100% renewable energy. Uh, so, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know what the, what the, you know, what it would be. It seem like the sources might be different. Um, I don't know. Um, it's just something to think about. Yeah, it would be a different talk. Maybe I, hopefully we'll get there or yeah. move move in that direction. So and that, this uh, same person uh, is asking for small plants to give away for Earth Day. So what what's your take on that? Yeah, 
And that's where, you know, size matters when it comes to air quality, according to the, the study conducted by uh, Yang et al. Uh, they were looking at um, in Chicago, um, you know, a lot of the different urban plantings and their impact on air quality. And so small plants aren't going to do as much for air quality, but they're going to be great for all kinds of other things. So uh, definitely don't forget the small plants. My favorite native species is the dwarf crested iris. So if you're um, I don't know. That's just my own personal uh, favorite. But um, so, yeah, just, you know, if you're talking about air quality, um, then, you know, unless you're talking about starters that are going to grow into larger plants uh, and you're wanting to have a focus on air quality, then in that yeah. case, you might want to focus on some of the ones I mentioned earlier, you know, the conifers and the, those with the waxy or hairy leaves. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, a small plant that will grow into um a tree perhaps. Yep. So I would say then something that's growing, going to grow into a large tree, you know, because size matters, as, you know, according to that study. Yeah. And, and uh, obviously, as you said, the, the, the length of time it lives and, and because that's how long it's sequestering that carbon. Right. So if you're wanting to, yeah, have that focus and yeah, definitely. I mean, there's uh, all kinds of research out there on, you know, which trees are going to be best for sequestering carbon. Yeah larger, uh, large crowns, long-lived, uh, definitely. Next question is close to home for me. A uh, person says, I live in Northeast Minneapolis, which is an industrial section of town. It certainly is. What plants are best for improving air quality? And you did address some of that. Yeah, uh, I don't recall if uh, the black locust is native to you up there. You probably probably be able to speak to that, Rita, but... Uh, uh, Iffy, uh, iffy, gotcha. you know, it, it could be okay. Um, it, it, it could be migrating at this point. But, <laughs> yeah. But, well, uh, if not, then don't. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah. I think that's uh, one species that, you know, um, you know, should be given some focus to planting in industrialized areas. Now, this addresses some things that you did talk about. Are there plants that can help clear ammonia or hydrogen sulfide that are emitted from local industrial facility? And yeah, if you could touch on that again. Yeah, now the ammonia was mostly related to, um, you know, poultry farms um, and, you know, the ammonia emissions from the tunnel fans from the poultry houses. Uh, and so, you know, what they found was, you know, the plants with the large biomass, so, um, you know, these uh, warm season grasses, uh, and using them as windbreaks. So um, again, you know, we're dealing with air quality emissions and trying to limit the spread from certain sources, you know, windbreaks and uh, various forms. Apparently with ammonia, uh, warm season grasses are going to be, uh, it's able, you know, to be able to trap those a little bit better. Uh, and they also found that, you know, they help keep the ammonia more on site um, too. So, um, you know, kind of was a step towards, in, in, in the article I mentioned towards, you um, you know, nutrient cycling as well, keeping the, the, the ammonia cycled a little more local instead of, you know, leaving the site, so. Now, this is a question about um, a, a small neighborhood. So if an entire housing development, um, that's an HOA, homeowners association, adopts use of these kinds of plants, can it improve the neighborhood air quality? I mean, you're really talking more about on a cumulative level. I mean, we were talking about local air quality while well, air moves around. So, I mean, it's hard to say uh, if it's an HOA that's in an area, um, you know, with the heavy, you know, depend, you know, I could see where there might be some high impact areas where you can have a more localized effect, uh, but uh, outside of these high impact areas, um, you know, you're, you're probably not, you, you know, the fact that you're going to see is going to be more when these plants are used on a larger uh, scale. Um, yeah. The more that we're using them, the better off we'll be. Yeah, I so, agree. And, you know, it, we really do need more of, of those plants encouraged, not just in HOAs, but in local uh, in jurisdictions all over the place. And I know that some states are moving to basically encourage more native plants. And I think they're still thinking in terms mostly of pollinators and so on, but 
as you said, as this makes clear your, your presentation, it's all about a wide range of native plants that right. function in many different ways, provide a lot of different ecological. Exactly. Systems. Like so, at my place, I live in, you know, outside of town in the country. So I'm able to focus more on pollinators when I decide what I'm planting. I'm not as concerned about the air quality so much, you know. So, you know, but if I lived in an urban area or an industrial, you know, also Arkansas is pretty rural, you know, not to say that we don't still deal with, you know, some of the things um, like eastern Arkansas, you know, I think, believe there's some areas that are impaired for certain contaminants in the air, uh, but where I'm at, you know, we're pretty good. So, but yeah, I think it's I'm trying to get people to kind of think a little bit outside the box that we've been in, in the native plant community, you know, um, uh, you know, just to, there's, there's a little bit more, you know, and not in any way wanting to take away from the pollinators at all, you know, but just to, to get people to consider uh, additional uses for native species on the landscape. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, it's grateful. We're very grateful for the massively increased understanding of the importance of pollinators, but now it needs mm -hmm. to go beyond that. You're absolutely right. Because the plants provide all of these different functions. Sure. Um, the next question is, do you need to use evergreen shrubs to improve your round air quality? It's definitely going to be better. I mean, you know, like I mentioned with the, uh, the, the, the conifers and those needles are going to be better at capturing those fine particulates. You know, most conifers, not all, but most are going to be evergreen. Uh, so you're going to get that year round benefit. Uh, so as opposed to most of our broadleaf trees, uh, so I would say if you're, you know, if you have the, the option uh, or the, uh, the opportunity to choose an evergreen, uh, that's definitely, you know, going to be to your benefit for air quality. I'm liking that answer because I love evergreens. I grew up with them yeah. and uh, my dad liked them. So uh, I, I'm actually planning to put one in the spring. Awesome. Yeah. So this is a question from an agroforestry technical service provider, wondering about your thoughts on agroforestry as a tool for outdoor air quality and why agroforestry is not more prevalent in this realm. Yeah, um, you know, trying to think how long are those trees growing, you know, as far as, you know, I haven't looked into the, the numbers on carbon sequestration. Um, you know, I know they're sequestering carbon, um, but I know those trees also don't get to, they don't stay in place for hundreds of years. I mean, as far as, you know, I think the location of some of these agroforestry operations um, could play a part, you know, they can serve as uh, windbreaks or buffers uh, for capturing you know, certain particulates, just if they were happen to be located near, you know, a power plant or an industrial area, that sort of thing. Uh, I know here in Arkansas, a lot of the, um, the, the civil culture is practiced in national forest. Uh, so, you know, I don't know that uh, that does a whole lot, except for the stretches that run along uh, I-40, I Interstate 40, you know, that might be providing some, some help there. Um, but yeah, I'd have to look a little more into the, the agro, agroforestry industry and um, how it might be benefiting through carbon sequestration. That I couldn't answer on that, that aspect. Yeah. The other aspect that it seems, this strikes me as part of regenerative practices, that this is a piece of a lot of different things that can happen at the same time. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's ways of managing forests also that are going to be more sustainable. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's what I've got here so far. Any last uh, comments before I do my little wrap up stuff here? Uh, no, I don't think I have anything to add here. Uh, looking forward to uh, next week's presentation and definitely appreciate the opportunity to uh, continue this series and go into a little bit more depth and breadth on um, the topics. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that too. So thank you so much, Eric. We appreciate it. And everybody have a wonderful evening.